name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, if you start uh, searching about the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church on YouTube, or even through the TV guide, it won't be long before you find stuff that will probably be called conspiracy theories by a lot of people. Uh, these things uh, argue that the Catholic Church has been infiltrated. It's a strong word. The idea is that some group or a people has entered within the church and is undermining its mission. And like anything on TV or YouTube, there are actually books about this kind of thing, about which the, uh, the media content is based. And all of it starts off with the same observation, an undeniable fact that unfortunately there are ugly points in the history of the church. And not only is this about kings and emperors, but there have been plenty of priests and even bishops that have written and taught and done things totally at odds with the teaching of our Lord and the church. Sometimes this is about violence or crime or links to the mafia. And other times it is people trying to get grips with the fact that every now and then there are priests that simply seem to be saying things that are completely contrary to the Catholic faith and, and people try and trying to make sense of what's going on. Maybe it's a priest saying all religions are basically the same or that thing that you were always taught to be a sin, well, it's not a sin anymore. Like I said, when, when Catholics come across these things, one conclusion is that there has been some deliberate and sneaky infiltration by some enemy. Because all of a sudden, ideas and practices that belong to the enemy are spotted within the life of the church. I noticed over the years that the books have shifted as to who has infiltrated the church. So if you read books that were written in the 60s and 70s, a lot of those books focus on the communists, a communist infiltration of the church. And in fact, one former communist spy, a woman called Bella Dodd, uh, offered quite a bit of evidence that said, uh, she showed, proved that something like this might have happened. But then, when you know, jump to the 90s, of course it's no longer the communists infiltrating the church. Authors tend to focus on secret societies, Freemasons, entering the church, becoming priests and bishops, and deliberately undermining the actual teaching of the church to try and destroy it from within. And then finally, in the last 20 years, it gets more sordid, and the books now talk about impure individuals infiltrating, often talking about active homosexuals becoming priests and bishops and undermining the teaching of the church and her credibility. And unfortunately, in this case, no one can deny the evidence because most of the clerical abuse of children has come from this kind of infiltration. So much evil and harm has been done. And whilst the effects of unbelieving and unfaithful clergy is sickening and painful, it shouldn't be a cause of surprise. Most of all, it shouldn't be the cause of us giving up our faith or weakening in our commitment. How often on home to home visits I've come across people who say that this infiltration, this evil, is the reason they don't come to Mass and Confession anymore. Well, my friends, today's gospel anticipates and gives a response to this. Some enemy has sown darnel amidst the wheat. Some enemy has come during the night and infiltrated the field, has caused harmful, toxic weeds to spring up amidst the wheat. This doesn't justify the evil or its existence, but the field, the field can be taken as an image of the church. And Jesus is telling us there's always going to be good and bad, even in the church. That doesn't stop the Catholic Church from being the true religion that our Lord founded. It doesn't stop us from wanting to invite people into the church and to find salvation. But it reminds us that we can be under no illusions. 
the church is always going to be infiltrated. The history of the Catholic Church on earth has been a 2,000 year history of God's field being infiltrated by all kinds of unbelieving and evil men trying to undermine her mission. We, will, we shouldn't be surprised when we spot, spot Darnell in the church. And I don't think this parable is saying, do nothing to prevent Darnell, or never try and remove Darnell. I think, it's trying, I think it's telling us, don't imagine that there will ever be a situation when the church is only full of saints. And you know, this is where reading the parable in terms of the life and history of the church isn't totally helpful. Because it makes us start looking around, looking at others, and spending our time getting angry rather than getting holy. Because our job in life is to become saints. And even if we read about evils among different people in the church's history, it's not like we can do anything about that, but we can do something about ourselves. Perhaps you remember the story about G.K. Chesterton, the famous Catholic writer of earlier last century. I think it might have been in the Times newspaper. There was a special edition in which they asked famous people to write on the subject, what's wrong with the world? And you had various articles written by great thinkers of their day with their take on what is wrong with the world. So I guess some probably focused on lack of education, others on poverty or the media or whatever, crime. But in G.K. Chesterton's contribution, and he was asked to submit an essay, the story goes that he just wrote back, Dear sirs, what's wrong with the world? I am. And that's the other way to read our parable today. Not just as a kind of history of the church and how the spotless bride of Christ, the ark of salvation, the means of holiness and grace is tragically always going to be composed of a mixture of great saints and weak sinners. Instead, we read it as a story about the human heart, about my heart and your heart. I have to admit, when I look inside my soul, I find both wheat and I find weeds. I find good things, good crops, and thorns, Dano. And the weird thing is, the two are often so bound up together, it's hard to move one without affecting the other. What I mean is, have you ever reflected on the fact that many of your greatest strengths or virtues are also at the same time a source of habitual sins? You know, for instance, if you're someone who's really smart and analytical and a good problem solver, well, that probably means you're going to struggle with arrogance and talking over others and being too critical. And if you're someone who is organized and punctual and tidy, you're probably going to struggle with nagging and forever correcting small defects and getting angry over minutia. And if you're someone who is blessed enough to be patient and calm and easygoing, you're probably going to struggle with being able to stand up for your faith and your principles of being able to say no to people when you really ought to. Maybe you'll struggle with giving the impression that you support things that are sinful and offensive to God. Each of us resembles that field in some way. Hopefully, at least, we might be able to look over and think, well, at least there's more wheat than Darnell. But when I realize my fallenness on a deep level, it makes me appreciate the sacrament of confession. Because I think you could say something miraculous happens in that sacrament. Because somehow, Darnell gets removed and wheat gets stronger and healthier. And that must be miraculous because, humanly speaking, it seems impossible to root out those weeds without affecting uh, the good crops. Even so, even with confession, the parable ends by telling us the only permanent solution will come at the end of history. Then not only will the church be purified of all evil men who have infiltrated her, but my body will rise from the dead. And if I've ended my life in God's friendship, in the state of grace, 
it will rise free from corruption with all evil passions and deep-rooted sins all the things I've struggled with cut away my heart has been infiltrated and whilst I should keep turning to the sacrament of confession and not give up the fight to purify it I can rejoice that God will provide the ultimate solution for our Lord says I am the resurrection and the life we need a total restoration thank God it begins in this life but it will only be fully completed in eternity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen